Our presenter today is Vince Opedisano, America's Product Manager for Transformer Products. Vince is based out of Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us, Vince. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, everybody, today we're going to be talking about a subject which has, uh, over the last uh, 15 years, changed dramatically in terms of how often we perform this test and its significance. Uh, in the days when I started uh, performing testing in the field, a uh, winding resistance was considered a, a more rare uh, test that we conducted as we could, but it was very difficult to do as we did not have the same types of equipment that are available to us today. In looking at this first slide, what we're talking about is not such a simple device as uh, we think of when we see a transformer. Here, the transformer is representative in a very complex or in a complete manner and you, the complexity other than the winding resistance which we seek to uh, achieve is shown in the uh, reddish colors. Uh, the other components do affect our results and how we achieve them and we'll, we'll talk about some of those methods of improving that, uh, uh, obtaining the results in, in a safe and efficient manner. Why we actually test winding resistance is, uh, is quite clear. It has uh, proven to be a very good diagnostic tool and one that gives us very um, <clears throat> good predictive um, values that we can use in determining the future direction or required effort in maintaining our transformers. The main one that uh, we see most often is the tap changer mechanism. On load tap changers especially, this is, a, this is the only moving part within the transformer which is subject to so many stresses. And so it becomes the primary reason we perform winding resistance tests. And we will focus on this area as, as much of the discussion. Uh, as well, we also want to detect or locate partial dead or, uh, or dead shorted turns. We look for secondarily, actually, uh, loose connections improper crimping, and that's typically after uh, remanufacture or after manufacturing, as well as under some strains and stresses that the transformers uh, encounter during operation. Uh, for poor efficiency, this is one <clears throat> more uh, usually subjected to by factory, where we're looking for the copper losses of the transformer as they are required as part of the uh, specification. We uh, use the winding resistance to measure winding temperature. That's a very common use when we're performing things such as dry out or in the factory when we want to know the winding temperature once we've heated the transformer for proper cooling down. As well, uh, we, we now want to talk about the principle of measurement. So when we think of a winding we think of a resistance, but we also have inductance. And it is the resistance that we care about, but it is the inductance of the winding which is dominant when we first begin the test. As we're applying DC, the one issue that we do have is the fact that uh, changing from zero amps to whatever our test current is, the inductance is dominant until such time as our current stabilizes. And once it stabilizes, then we are left with just the current uh, and the resistance of the uh, winding itself together with the tap connections. And with that, if we have the current and we have the resistance or the voltage, we now are able to determine the resistance. And this is a principle of measurement which many of us are, are commonly uh, understanding. Well, when we're talking about this, Technically, what we need to do is we need to change the, the current to be at zero. So for it to be at zero, we need for the transformer core to saturate. In order for the transformer to saturate, uh, we apply voltage times seconds. And in the seconds, that is the time that is required and if you look at this picture in front of you, you will see that the amount of time uh, needed 
would be higher, as your experience would tell you. And that is all based on, in this case, the voltage rating of that transformer. So in this case, the time to stabilize might be very different from something like a pull top or, or even um, any of your uh, uh, small power transformers. We know that the larger the winding, which is reflective of inductance, the greater the difficulty to perform the test. This is borne out by a lot of experience that many of you had in uh, testing over the years. Once we, we do know that we have that problem to overcome, we also need to understand a little bit about what we're testing. And in that case, we want to typically discuss on-load tap changers. So the first type we'll talk about today are reactive types. Now, they're designed to uh, take the energy through transition and minimize the amount of current that passes through the winding as we're trying to change the tap. Uh, although many of us think of simple switches, as you can see in the right, some of the mechanisms can be very complex as they need to be, and they're handling quite a lot of power. And in this case, you know, there are things such as preventative autos that limit the circulating current when in bridging positions. Without such uh, components, we end up with very high currents, and the high currents can cause damage to both the switch and to the winding itself. Now, when they operate, their time to operate is all dependent on their design and on the needs based on the application. And in this case, they're typically they run at uh, 0.3 to 0.7 seconds, or they can be set to run slower if the demand is not so uh, critical. When we look at them, many of us think of just a switch, but in fact, this is the uh, typical uh, operation. Um, uh, this is uh, a tap changer made by Reinhausen, and in that, you can see in the non-bridging position where these um, devices now handle the current evenly on both sides and then allow the uh, current to flow uh, freely with, with uh, good operation. But once we go into the bridging position from the non-bridging position, now there's more energies involved. Each uh, inductor in this case has to divide the current or does divide the current. And so we, we have a different uh, particular condition. And once we see all of this, we can now uh, go to what the particular graph would look like for that particular type of tap changer. Now, in this case, what you'll notice is you do not get this nice, smooth line that uh, many of us are accustomed to. Um, in speaking about that, and le let me take a little bit of time um, to describe it. When I started doing uh, winding resistance tests on transformers, my first concern was windings themselves. And uh, being new to it, and this was, I guess, about 30 years ago, uh, we looked at the values and compared them uh, only to themselves. So we'd compare A to B to C, and in doing so, look for the differences. But then we found that with load tap changers, that looking at the differences on each tap, and there could be as many as 33 taps, we found it difficult to gauge whether the value was reflective of correct or incorrect uh, amounts. And so we started to graph the results. And many of you do, some of you don't, but if you're not, um, I would suggest to you that this is a quick way for us to determine the condition of a load tap changer and all of its taps uh, running through transition. This is also useful for offload as well because we can now tell that the switch itself is not adding any values, any resistances not expected in the uh, ratio turns. And in this case, though, you can see it's a little more difficult when there's a preventative auto to see whether each value lines exactly. 
When we move into load tap changers, now we've got uh, a resistive type. Now resistive types are actually in the world more common than inductive types. So in, in inductive or reactive types, um, from a worldwide perspective, are about 30% used in the market, whereas resistive is about 70%. And as such, uh, more times we use resistive on tap changers on the high side. Now, it's not saying they can be, can't be used on the low side, but with higher currents, low tap changers on the low side would be more efficient as inductive or reactive than they would be as resistive. In this case, they do run as fast as the reactive type. They involve a uh, diverter switch, as you can see, A and B. And as well, they instead of using these inductors or reactors, they're using transition resistors to limit the, the uh, current during a tap change. There is, in this case, no bridging position. They do not stop in the middle. They simply go from one tap to the next. And so if you're looking now at the curves that are involved, you can see here that we have a very nice V-shaped curve. Now in this case, there is no, um, for the nominal, there is no uh, before and after nominal, or there is no, uh, how can I say, there, there's sometimes a flat spot in the nominal position, and that's when there is a, uh, the, where the reversing switch is involved, they don't have a resting position for it, or a, an A or a B is, is what I've seen it as. So it's nominal A, nominal B in between. Uh, we expect here a straight line, or a relatively straight line, and in this case, this one, this result is a single phase DC converter transformer and we only have one phase to deal with. If we had B and C phase to deal with, we would expect that all three phases follow this particular phase. That being said, when tap changers, when low tap changer, changers are positioned on one or another side of a transformer, it typically causes the farthest um, winding, let's say C winding, uh, if it was farthest from the tap changer, uh, would end up being slightly higher than A and B. And this is common. And so the differences, although there is a difference between the windings, they do at least follow this particular curve. Now, when we are testing again with tap changers, um, we do want to know the condition of the tap. Um, there are a number of modern new methods, which we will not go into today, uh, called dynamic resistance. And dynamic resistance is in itself a subject which could take easily an hour to describe, to discuss. Um, it is my opinion that dynamic resistance for transformers is in its early stages, and so there are many known entities, many known uh, values, but we are not consistent enough for the field personnel to utilize this technology so much as the staff or the engineering teams back in the uh, uh, offices of the uh, of the owners of the asset or the transformer. In this case, I wanted to describe what I first used at uh, an, a utility that used to be called Ontario Hydro uh, 30 years ago. And in this case, they showed me a small battery, and we're talking the size of a 9-volt battery, a resistor, a light bulb, and the winding. And in this case, we would take the connection you see here, and then we would run the tap changer through transition. So we would power, and the light bulb would be off, because once the uh, current flows through the winding and everything balances out, it was not a lot of current, then as we transition through the taps, the light bulb would stay off until such time or if 
at such time there was any type of break before make. And if there was, the light would flash. And we would confirm this by going back to that position and retrying it and looking for it. Now, this is a very crude method. It did not find all of our issues, but it did find the obvious issues that were not apparent to us when we were uh, uh, running through basic maintenance of the transformer. Today's equipment, at least equipment made by Megger, in this case, uses a break before make in similar fashion to what you saw on the previous page, but now we are able to actually perform timing. And in timing, we don't want to actually give you a time because that becomes confusing for most operators in the field, although we, we started to do so early on in, this, uh, in the introduction to this. What we decided to do is, is give you levels. So we have a low, a medium, or high. And if the transformer has a very good tap changer, uh, one that's relatively uh, well maintained or is well designed, <clears throat> the transition can be set to five milliseconds. And we fully expect that as you transition and you run through the test, that the detector will not uh, turn on and that threshold is a 10% change for the specific time, in this case, 5 milliseconds. If there is this time exceedance, then a little light will turn on or a detection that says it has exceeded this time. If every tap were to fail 5 milliseconds, then we would know that 5 milliseconds is not uh, proper for this particular tap changer, or possibly, and this is rare, that the tap changer is totally malfunctioned on every single position, every single phase. We typically think of exceptions when we do this test. And so we would go to the medium uh, sensitivity, which is 20, and then low, which is 80. Now, it should be set at this time. When the time for transition exceeds 200 milliseconds, then the current of the test set, in, in Megger's case, turns off. For any test set, uh, 20 mi 200 milliseconds uh, being on or being open would create quite a large voltage and as such would create or, or uh, bring damage, potential damage, to the instrument or to the transformer under test. And so we want to limit this uh, type of activity to, to a known state. And so depending on the age, number of operations, uh, and the type of the LTC, one can change the sensitivity. A typical practice for, for us is to set it to the highest and see if that tap changer uh, is enabled at five. And it typically it is not, then we run it through all at the highest sensitivity. Once you've done all of this, and in this case they'd set the medium one, you can see where the make break is simply reported as pass. And so this particular transformer did uh, make all or meet all of the requirements for uh, break before make. Now, in order to be optimum, in performing winding resistance tests, in order to do it in the least amount of time, one of the key conditions is open circuit voltage. This is from our previous slide where for saturation, we want to saturate the core. We must saturate the core in order to begin to measure the resistance. To do so, we, we need the voltage, which is the test voltage, times time. Therefore, and this is why we have it in red, therefore test instruments with higher open circuit voltage require less time to establish flux and saturate the core. This is not a rule that can be changed. And people that who tell me that we need more current, I'm not saying they don't, but the key, the first thing that we must have is higher 
open circuit voltage. So what time do we need to saturate the core? Well, that is dependent upon the winding that you are testing. So in the cases of windings with very high voltages, we need more time. And so we require this time uh, relative to windings with less voltage. The current is going to be discussed in the next slide, and we will get at least an understanding of where the importance comes for current. So if we look at the actual saturation characteristic as you're saturating the core, and this is on the right, you can see what happens to the current and the voltage as one as the current goes up, the voltage drops down, and then we reach the saturation where there's a maximum flux, and then there's a, uh, a particular minimum saturation level, at least the saturation flux level, and there's the whole curve in the green. The area we'd like to avoid is in red, and in this case, it's not the voltage that assists us in avoiding this level. This is now related to selecting a test current. So the one rule that we have established and one that uh, we have tried to get our customers to adhere to, because many of them do call us about the instrument doesn't work, doesn't give me readings fast enough, or in some cases works, uh, but the reading is uh, not consistent on one side versus the other, we follow these rules. The first rule, in order to avoid that red area, is to try to inject above 1% of rated current. It's not exactly 1%, but we remember 1%. A lot easier than 0.657 or, or whatever level we, we find we need. It's a comfortable level to reach. It's, it's, it's on the higher end, but at least we know that is a goal. The other limit is the 15%. This is as per ANSI and IEC. Now, within our test instruments and within, a, within our automation, we don't want to get to 15. Uh, we know we can, but we typically set, as recommended, 10%. And so at 10%, we are well within what should be achievable in performing winding resistance testing in a reasonable time. Unfortunately, some of the typical test currents range from 0.1 to 15% of rated current. And at 0.1 to 1%, when you're less than that 1%, many of them become difficult to maintain stability. And so, if current is less than 1%, measured resistance may not be consistent. And or it'll be stable, but then becomes unstable, and this is due to maintaining the saturation of the core, in other words, removing the influence of the inductance continuously. Hey Vince, uh, I have a question from John. So when okay. comparing resistance values between phases, do you also use a percentage threshold to determine the problem? Yes, we, we do look for a threshold uh, but the threshold is guided by um, IEC and ANSI, and it is uh, set to 2%. That is the limit that we are typically given. But the truth be known, if a transformer is built with more than 2%, then one must take a trend. So what was it ever before, and what is it now? And if it maintains that difference, then we know that if it exceeds the 2%, but it was when we first got it, then it is fine. But typically, and I didn't put it into this presentation because we looked at efficiencies, 2% is the limit. Okay, thank you. Now, you're welcome. Applying large test currents. Now, here is something that most everybody I talk to asks me for more current. So. Um, we would like more current, more current. Why? 
because typically people want to do their jobs quickly. Let me say this, that over the years, the time performing testing did not involve winding resistance as it does today. We would only do winding resistance on special transformers, not all transformers. Today, with the advent of the test equipment, we are testing winding windings of all transformers. And as such, sometimes, many times, it becomes the dominant time factor of the day when we're doing our testing. And so we want to get our testing done quickly so as to move on and to be more efficient. Higher test currents do have adverse effects that we need to consider. So one of them is that when we're saturating the core, we have to demagnetize. And the more current one applies, the more deeply one magnetizes the core. And so we do not want to create a condition which is going to be more and more difficult to bring back. Secondly, when testing on the high side windings, it's typically on the high side, the large test currents may actually increase the test time unnecessarily. So if we reach saturation, and we now exceed it. Let's say saturation may be achieved at 2 or 3 or 4 amps, and yet we're going to apply 10 or 15 or 20 amps. Then we are going beyond where we need to go to get good, fast, and stable readings. And so we want to think about what we are applying when we apply it. The last one is the obvious one, and that is if we exceed that 15% limit, then we can actually change the winding resistance values over time as the windings warm up or heat up, especially when they're cold. And as that resistance changes, that destabilizes your circuit until such time as it comes to uh, the set. And that destabilization happens because the changing resistance changes the current and, and, and then the inductance comes back as the DI, DT. Um, another question. Are these sure. currents you are applying uh, DC or AC? Oh, no, absolutely. Uh, they must be DC. Uh, a transformer is designed to handle quite a lot of flux AC. And as such, uh, they're handling many hundreds of thousands of volts. And they're handling many thousands of amps, in some cases hundreds of amps in, in others. And as such, those are all AC. When we perform winding resistance testing, we cannot use AC. We have to use DC. Because otherwise, we're getting the impedance of the winding. And that's back in that first diagram. We're seeing the impedance. We are not seeing the R, the resistance. The only way to see the resistance is by applying DC current and then letting that core saturate so that all of the inductive effects of impedance are removed and we're left with only the R value. Hopefully that is, is sufficient for the question. If not, we'll find out. Magnetic flux. So what we have are turns on a core, and in this case we have high and low side. It is optimum, in this case this single phase example, to set up the flux in the same direction. And if we do so, we help saturate the core and do so in a manner that removes that inductive effect and now allows us to see the resistance purely. And so what you will see in this case is the direction is coming into H1, and if we were to set it up, comes out of X1, and that would set it up into the same direction. What, more, what is more typical for our applications, for the audience here, are three-phase transformers. The single-phase one was just an example to show flux direction.
But when you have three phase chords, it is not the same as just one direction because as you apply current, in this case from H1 to 0, you will be setting up flux direction from 0 to H2 and, and also from 0 or neutral to H3. So B and C are running in the other direction. So when we're performing the testing now, this must be taken into consideration. So in this case, in the first case, with a winding neutral, we have both conditions possible. So we can run from 1 to 0, and in testing the winding from 1 to 0, we apply or measure the voltage from 1 to 0, in this case H. As well, if one decided to, if there's no neutral on the particular winding, what we can do is apply current from phase to phase, 1 to 2. And in this case, we can achieve the 1 to 0 value between potential connected to H1 and potential connected to H3. It is a winding which is no current flowing through it, or a bushing with no current flowing through it as well, but we now have reach potentially into what the HO connection sees. And so we can H1, H0 by using that H3 bushing. As well, if we decided H2, H0, we use that same H3 bushing to reach
even though your first reading may be done, B and C are still catching up. And so even though it seems steady, you're going to get these slow changes in A because of B and C. Because that voltage is only half, sometimes it takes a longer time. And so if A is still saturated and B and C become saturated, then it will stabilize. It is under these conditions that we typically want either higher voltage or what will help us are some higher currents, at least reaching the 1% or 2% uh, plateau. So if we take all of these examples and we look here in the dual injection, the reason we, we do so isn't just to saturate the core, but in this case, what we do is we perform two tests at one time. Because winding resistance takes so long, doing two tests or three tests or four tests at one time is the optimum way from an efficiency perspective. And here we ground one end. Now, grounding is not critical except under conditions of interference because we're measuring such low entities, some low voltages, once the core saturates. And we flow it in the same direction as you see in this arrow. Just to give you an example of how that looks, from a single injection, we would apply, as you see, the black on the left, coming in through the red out the black, and then if you're having dual two windings in series, then what we want to do is flow them the same so that the flux flows upwards in both directions. One of the areas that we've found recently, I'll say, actually it was quite a while ago, but as, a, as, as far as practices goes, we can magnetize faster by using two winds in the series because of the factor of the turns ratio, not only because of the fact that we're doing two. And so we get a much bigger, faster effect on most, not all, but on most or many transformers by performing a series test. So here we see on a three-phase core where we actually take, uh, this is a typical construction, where the windings are connected in series such that the flow runs in the same direction. Now, when you take a delta and a Y, again, we want the core to see flow in the same direction. And so we have set it up here for a delta Y. This is probably the most common setup that one sees. And here for a YY, we're doing some of the same thing. Just different examples. For auto transformers, here now we get to where we are flowing between 1 and 0, and we're measuring x1 to x0. Now, let it be said here, the one danger in running two tests at once, and one that we found out over our experience, is the fact that we are not measuring the resistance of x1 to the x1 bushing. Unless there is current flowing through the X1 bushing, we do not know if there's any loose connections from the winding through the bushing to the external world. And so that is a test that we do want to at least do once through that bushing so that we validate that the connections are proper. Maybe a little bit complex to understand without a drawing, but that is the case that we've experienced. In this case here, same example where we're running current through 1, H1, out through H3, the H0 bushing has no current flowing through it. We are only reading potential. And so having one reading where current flows through that one bushing is very useful. Now we typically get that resistance when we do our second test in this example, which would be H2 to H0. 
So H2 to H0 is including the current flowing through the H0 bushing. Let it also be said here, what we are performing 1 to 3 is because in the core, we apply current through the outer phases is a more balanced condition than trying to flow current from H1 to H2. So we typically do 1 to 3 and then H2. That's everything there is what we call a balanced state within the core. And so here are just other examples. And in this case, we have instruments that measure four windings. So we can measure all four windings at one time. And if there are taps on one side, we simply run all the current through, and then we change the taps on the one side with the LTC, and then record through the number of taps as we're uh, uh, wherever we decide to start and finish. Here is a typical connection. This is one of our, in fact, future instruments. Um, but we have, this is a version of an MTO connected to all windings at once. Last topic that uh, we want to talk about of importance is demagnetization. There have been a number of things that we thought over the um, years as far as how to properly demagnetize. Uh, it's been a lesson that we've been uh, learning in some ways the hard way by practical experience, but from the standards it's now clear everyone wants to demagnetize their transformers, wants to do so properly. So today, most of today's equipment have demagnetization features. If not, you should seriously consider that as an important part of it. Um, and in doing so, we want to make sure that we have um, very good um, criteria for demagnetization. The old methods, the ones that I've seen at some utilities, in fact, some still use them, and I won't say who, car battery with a switch and a resistor. Uh, what we have found in our research, instead of doing three phase, which is how we'd started, that performing a single phase, the center leg, the middle leg, which is, let's say, H2 to H0, is as effective as three phase. Now, in our test equipment, because some customers want to test all three phase or demagnetize, we have allowed that. Even though it takes three times longer, it is a sense of stability that, that people would, uh, would want. And so we allow that to happen um, in spite of what we think is, is better judgment. As well, what we have done, we've learned, is that we need to apply more steps. We do not do uh, very coarse steps. We get start coarse and then we run very fine in order to bring the transformer to a closer state of of uh, demagnetization than we had previously done. As a summary, winding resistance measurements are not simple. It is not simply Ohm's law. We do not use AC, we must use DC, and in doing so, we now have the resistance that must be sorted out from the inductive effects of the winding. Important. Saturation of the core, that is key to the beginning stages of our testing. Volts times seconds is a rule that if you look at a transformer, that you will see that its winding voltage will determine how long it will take you to saturate it. It must be stable before you can achieve readings, and you cannot do anything until that time is reached. So the DC current is very important in this respect, that it have no ripple or minimal, minimal amounts of ripple. We have the time constant of inductance over resistance, so if the resistance is very slow, this is the cost that we have in front of us. Delta windings. They are typically the problem child for most of us in testing. And on the low side, a delta plus its low resistance is an issue which require higher currents to stabilize. The make before break, we can get into fancy dynamic resistance, but the first test we should do is running the 
test set with DC through LTC operation and knowing that it does or doesn't operate properly in that the test set's current continues to flow. And lastly, we talk about returning the winding to its original state. There are many tests that we want to do on a transformer, and if we do winding resistance before some of them, we will get effects which may lead us to believe we have a problem where we do not. And so that is important on that respect. And so here's a list of some of the instruments that Megar offers for performing these tests. And these instruments uh, have a number of those features built into them as we've discussed. We, from our experience, apply currents in the right directions to optimize the time to give us the most efficiency in testing. And we record everything as we run the test um, and or save it such that we can now determine the proper state of a winding and more importantly of its load tap changers and in fact its offload the DETC. That is my presentation from this time and if you have any questions, hopefully I've answered every single issue there is. Uh, this is an overview. There is much more detail available in any one of those aspects, but at least gives us an idea on what we can do and how we can improve our testing practices as we conduct them today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them in the box now. So we'll start um, asking some of the ones that we've gotten so far. Um, so Ryan wants to know, is there a temperature standard that we need to correct for when we're measuring resistance? Uh, according to the standards, if we, if we feel it necessary, and if we want to compare trending, that we correct windings, and I've seen two standards, one is 75 Celsius, the other is 85 Celsius. And in our all of our forms, all of our instrument forms, and in our automated uh, testing, we provide a checkbox that corrects or does not correct the winding resistance. Regardless of the correction, uh, typically we're looking for the curve, and the curve gives us the critical information that we use to determine whether that winding can go or whether that transformer can go back into service for the next one, three, five, or even seven years. Okay, so if our test set is capable of anything from 10 to 50 amps, what? How do we know the best voltage, that, uh, best current that we need to choose for a transformer of a specific voltage? So the voltage of the transformer means nothing, and in fact, what we have added to our automated forms lately and in fact all of our uh, all of our uh, testing is a recommended test current so what we have learned is that many customers instead of phoning us and, and asking prior to doing the testing we're going to give them a recommended level we don't apply it because we let the operator choose but it's between the one and 15 percent level and we recommend or at least in our automated form 10%. So we try to set it to about 10% of the rated current of the winding. So a high unless it's an auto transformer. And so each side will have a recommended level. And if one is higher than the other, it's the lower current if you're running a series test. If you're running the windings in series, high and low, it's the lower current that you must follow as a test setting. Okay, so another question. If you talked a bit about um, the reading stability, and then I think on some of the, our equipment we have a percentage stability reading that comes up. So what is the recommended minimum value we should look for? Like 90%, 95 99.9? Nine nine percent before we stop. Yeah. Yes. In fact, I, I just come back from um, a conference where that became 
a discussion point, and I've had this discussion point now enough that um, it's going to require clarification of some type. Um, what we decided to do um, a number, about a year ago or a year and a half ago, is customers were saying, well, when do I take a reading? And there are certain levels that we look for. And so here's, here's the first thing. We want a reading to stop changing. And that, that sounds very easy. But for some transformer windings, that stable number is not so easily achieved. And so we put a little indicator that helps. Instead of watching the number, the light will change a color based on your settings. Now the question becomes, well, Vince, when I got the instrument, the light turned green, but the reading wasn't correct, and we find out that they're setting, they assume the setting. We all assume somebody knows, but we don't because every transformer is different. And I could set it very, very high, but then sometimes the stability may not, be, you may not need to wait so, so long. And so we have what are two settings. One of them is called stability of the reading. So if the reading maintains a value over a period of time to within your setting, and let's say 99.9. .9. That means that result cannot change by 0.1% or the light will not turn green. And if uh, So it'll stay amber or whatever the color is. And as such, when it stays that way for a period of time, one second, two seconds, and then continues to stay green, your second criteria now kicks in. So if it stays green, and it stays green for your second criteria, which is, let's say, two seconds. Well, two seconds may not be enough for a very high voltage winding, like 300 kV, 150 MBA. And so now becomes the need to wait longer. And so what I typically do, my typical practice, is to run the winding the first time, especially if I'm doing load tap changers or winding with a load tap changer, and I'll visually watch how long it takes and time it. And once I get the first time, then I'll know that the approximate time would be somewhere in the order of 10, 20 seconds after I first see the reading appear to be stable. And so I would set 99.8, 99.9 .9 plus 10 seconds or 15 seconds. That means that some windings will require, that's how slowly they change. That's how slowly that saturation happens. And then I, I do so. Each reading may take 40, 45 seconds, but that is the nature of that particular winding. I hope that's answered it. It's not a clear um, explanation because it's not a very easy to understand concept. But I typically raise it, the setting stability to 99.8 or 99.9 .9, and for a time that increases the before reading. So I would set it, instead of 2, I would set 10 or 15 seconds. And then I get valid readings. And you know it's wrong when your V curve starts to go out of shape. I hope that's answered that question. Not not so simple. <laughs> okay. Um, so talking about demagnetization, I have a couple questions. Um, how do we know when the core has been demagnetized? And then if we're putting the unit right back into service after testing, do we really need to worry about demagnetization? Yeah. That's in fact that's a. Um, that, that's something that, uh, here, here's the conundrum that we will run into. If you worry about demagnetizing, in other words, oh, have I demagnetized? As soon as you try to demagnetize, you're affecting the core. So in other words, by trying to measure the demagnetization, you must demagnetize. Because you must magnetize in order to know where the state is in applying a DC. And so our history our experience tells us that if we're not sure, we simply demagnetize again. And or we've given you the ability to demagnetize all three cores just in case, and we do so in the proper way. Everything we've done in our software is totally automated to our experience and understanding demagnetization. And so, yes, 
there is no indicator for state of demagnetization. Because as soon as you go, as soon as you try to measure it, you're affecting it. So you may make it worse, or you may make it better, just by trying to measure the state of demagnetization. Not a simple subject either. Okay, maybe we'll have time for one last one. Um, can you perform dual injection on a delta winding? Um, <clears throat> on, on a delta delta, is that the question? Would they know? Is that because? Um, yeah, there's only one delta in the question, so <laughs> we'll assume okay. whatever you want to assume. So first of all, when we have a delta winding, we can only test one of the three legs of the delta. We cannot test two legs of the delta. That that is not possible in any accurate way that uh, that we have figured out or anyone else to this stage. But to test a delta-delta, when you have a delta-delta winding, and I have seen them uh, as you know a small number, but I have seen them. In fact, the delta-delta is the most difficult winding to saturate properly because you have you have two cores with circulating current affecting each other as you apply DC to one side, it affects the other side. And so the best way to test the delta-delta winding is in series, one winding to its same phase on the other side. And so that has been our experience that the delta-delta windings are best tested in series. You don't necessarily need to record the resistance on one side versus the other. Like You don't have to do dual voltage measurements. You can just get the one you want, but they saturate more completely when you connect them in series. Oh, actually, the uh, Thomas has clarified. He said uh, a delta Y winding. Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, if we look at a delta Y winding from some of what we had shown, this is, again, you're going to test the two phases that are in the same direction. That is the goal. That is what you try to do. The ones that are closest to the same direction, and so in this case, you're going to test uh, here on the screen. You would see uh, both of them go flowing in the right uh, way to to saturate the core uh, effectively. And this is done where you see here wires in our three-phase instruments. We do this all internally. We we choose it all internally. 